vamos a iniciar la primera parte de las exposiciones, dando lugar a las ponencias de los invitados extranjeros. Les recuerdo que estas exposiciones tendrán una duración máxima de 30 minutos y rogamos entonces eh, sujetarse a esa condición. En primer lugar, el doctor Duncan Pedersen, que ustedes ya conocieron, ¿cierto? Quien es eh, director de la Iniciativa de Salud Mental Global y de la División de Psiquiatría Social y Transcultural de la Universidad McGill. Eh, expone sobre el tema Ideologías de la Salud Global Postcolonial y Emergencia del Neoliberalismo y su Impacto en la Salud Mental Global. Doctor. dirigirme entonces a ustedes en inglés, así me lo han pedido, me excuso a aquellos, para aquellos de habla hispana. Voy a tratar de hacer un Spanglish hasta donde sea posible, para no, no tengan duda en interrumpirme si he dicho algo que no es del todo entendible. A veces yo mismo no me entiendo, o sea, es que no es nuevo para mí. Uh, he elegido este tema porque me parece que vale la pena eh, describir un poco para ustedes lo que eh, debe reconocerse que es esta historia poscolonial ¿no? que ha tenido tanta influencia en el desarrollo de la forma en que atendemos a las personas con problemas de salud mental. Uh, y quiero decir por postcolonial, y aquí voy a pasar entonces a mi primer o mi segundo slide, Ah, quiero declarar que no tengo conflictos de interés. There's no conflict of interest. And we understand for postcolonial global health and for postcolonial is some is the description of the ways of seeing health, a worldview of health that emerged during an historical moment whose defining features include but not were limited to the revolt against the former colonial order that followed the 19th and 20th century Euro-American Euro expansion. And of course, between there and the end of the Cold War, uh, uh, it followed right after the Cold War what we call nowadays in common language neoliberalism. And I think that all those are responsible for the transformations associated with, with the phenomena of globalization. So, uh, among the most salient uh, features uh, or contextual elements of globalization influencing population health at a global scale, we may distinguish the ones that are on the screen now. First, growing concerns shared by mostly wealthy nations with emerging diseases such as HIV AIDS, perceived as threats to the national security. This is a new phenomena that globalization has brought us. There are certain diseases, diseases that because of their characteristics, they do threaten the national security. And that new qualification of a disease category is emerging in the United States above all. And has, has keep the influence in many of the rich countries up to nowadays. The second element is the consequences of growing geopolitical tensions. Protracted armed conflict, wars, terrorism, and lethal violence experienced by and large by low and middle income countries. The third uh, contextual element is climate change. This is a phenomenon also of recent relatively recent proportions, pushing our planetary boundaries to the limits and the emergence of a devastating, sometimes uh, devastating um, epidemics, mainly today concentrated in the African failing economies. 
I have the Ebola as one of the uh, phenomena that really threaten uh, and qualifies very well this emergence of new entities in of of great uh, epidemics as we know it today. The fourth element is the voracious capital investment for profit and the trade wars and being fought around the globe. Competing regional trade agreements, I will mention just for the example, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is recently uh, being signed by, uh, among other countries, Chile and Peru, I believe, uh, and more importantly, trades on the intellectual property rights, like TRIPS, uh, regulating the transnational flow of financial resources, goods, and transfer of medical technologies, including drugs and pharmaceuticals, and finally, and not least, the ensuing overall expansion of transnational corporations, all of which are most often generating and reinforcing power disparities and social inequalities, which are at the roots of global health and at the root, very root of global mental health as well. It is against this conundrum of shifts in power and accountability and governance in a context of increasing social inequalities, and the, one, the person who preceded uh, me referred that Chile has a very high Gini coefficient, is signaling that this is one of the most unequal, socially unequal countries. Income inequalities are very great in this context. Uh, and also, not only of increasing social inequalities, but also of decreasing social justice. In addition to this climate change that I referred to, and concurrent challenges in the biosphere integrity, uh, post-colonial global health ideologies continues its surge and its current propositions, while being tested and implemented, are also being challenged and contested. Some are now calling not only for global health, but they are calling for a new, a new theme, which is planetary health. And we will come back to that notion maybe in the Advanced Study Institute that we are now uh, pushing or formulating for this uh, later this year. I have chosen, in, in, in short, uh, four points. Uh, and a conclusion for this uh, first presentation. The first point is the paradox, the paradox that remains to be explained between advanced knowledge and rising inequalities. The second has to do with what we call the dilemma of foreign policy and health. The third one is a paradigm shift that is needed and the fourth and last is the unequal and unfair distribution of global resources. Uh, first, the paradox. Uh, that remains to be explained. Despite impressive numbers of uh, scientific and technological advances in health interventions, including few innovations, coupled with a substantial rise in funding of global health, in fact, overall, funds in development assistance for health more than quadruple between 1990 and 1913. Uh, there you have a, a graph showing, in effect, this growth from uh, 1990 to 2013. And, and you will observe from this graph the major growth that has not happened in the international, which is on orange, distribution of resources, which is international agencies, but has grown in the green uh, path along the presence of new uh, actors, particularly non-governmental organizations and private foundations. This is where the money is coming from at this point, and it has a very important uh, as you could see from the rest of the graph, 
the blue represents, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, some of the countries. In uh, the light uh, brown, uh, the Canadian uh, investment, and in the bottom of it, in red, the United States growth in terms of investment in development assistance for health. So, despite of this growth, uh, inequalities in wealth and health between and also in within countries are persistent and in many cases are on the rise. Uh, we are still confronted with poor health outcomes for a greater proportion of the world's population, a global failure now exacerbated by the global financial crisis. There are critical questions that are raised here, and the first one that I come, I'd like to ask to address is why poverty affecting most, almost half of the world's population, continues its devastating effects in global health despite sustained scientific and economic progress of a few. And how do we explain that wealthy nations, and Canada is one of the examples, are not ashamed so many people in this world are relegated to lives with no opportunities to reach their full human potential. The second issue, very closely linked to the first one I just mentioned, is that in the Canadian experience, global health values remain still lar are largely implicit, under-theorized, and lacking consent definitions, revealing ambiguities and epistemological tensions between the global and the local. The dilemma of foreign policy as health versus health as foreign policy is still omnipresent. The dilemma consists of richer countries wanting to contribute for improved public health in poorer countries as an act of altruism, that is for the sake of improving health in those countries, or and here is the dilemma of a promising way to protect and advance their own interests. Among the many questions surfacing here and still claiming for an answer are why and how global health interventions in low middle income countries should be undertaken by rich countries such as Canada. What are the main values embedded into our current global health policies and programs? And how can we move forward in global health research and action agenda without being explicit about our own social values and our own societal goals? I think Canada is a good example of a transition that's happening between the previous government, which lasted for almost 10 years by Harper, a conservative government, who had a very different foreign policy that the one has now been proclaimed by the new elected Prime Minister Trudeau. And this is one way of approaching this subject. There are hidden agendas in the help that countries, poor countries, are receiving from the north, from the global north. And among those hidden agendas are always vested interests of major corporations and private business uh, who are tinting much of the help that's been offered and received. Then, there is a global recognition now that we need to critically re-examine the ethical foundations of global health and rebuild an ethical frame, making explicit the values and moral principles underpinning those foundations. A central value, which we need yet to make explicit in Canada, is the global social justice and equity framework within which should be operating in the years to come, especially after this political change that it's just happened. The third point <coughs> I want to refer briefly is the inescapable overriding issue of em emerging from these questions, uh, which is the need for a paradigm shift what do I mean by paradigm shift? I mean this 
is a real change in the current explanatory models of health and disease to include in this analysis the broader social determinants and health gradient in explaining the occurrence and distribution of death, disease, and disability. Let me expand a bit more this third point, which in my view is, remains a foundational stone of the paradigm shift needed to build the framework for social ju global justice and equity in global mental health research. Over the last few decades, the field of epidemiology has focused on the individual, the individual biology, the individual behavior, the individual exposure, and even the sub-individual levels, the molecular level, even the field of molecular epidemiology has come up uh, with new propositions configuring the so-called biomedical model of disease causation. This model has been progressively challenged because of its limitations in identifying multiple causes and explaining the dynamics and asymmetric distribution of diseases, conditions in the population. For example, there is no biological explanation for the gross inequality found between the overall life expectancy of, say, Canada today, 82 years, when compared to the peoples of, say, Mozambique or Sierra Leone, which is 39 years. So there is a double digit <laughs> a difference. It, it, it is a, almost a duplication in the number of years of life expectancy between rich countries and extremely poor countries. Now, I come to my point. These inequalities cannot be explained by biological reasons or causes only, but rather are likely to be determined by the differences in the daily conditions of life. In other words, uh, in the daily conditions of life, in other words, on the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, and in the fundamental drivers of these conditions, the unfair distribution of power, money, and resources. It seems clear to me that the step on the right direction that we will have to make is to acknowledge the fact that unless the political and economic realities are incorporated into our research and action programs, towards a new architecture of global health and a new architecture of global mental health, that we begin to address existing social inequalities in Canada and at the global level. The gap between the rich and the poor will continue widening with consecutive impoverishment of large segments of the population and negative consequences, both in the natural environment and in the global mental health. Fourth, and this is my last, last point of the list, is the economy and ecology are fundamentally two separate domains. Um, uh, that we know of, if distributed fairly on a global scale, there will be enough on earth for all to lead decent life in dignity. It's be, it is uh, the mismanagement and the concentration and accumulation of resources by a few uh, that will necessarily result not only in reinforcing further social inequalities, but also in increasing insecurity and instability, rising conflicts and violence, following by more suffering, disease, and death. The quest of wealthy nations, of perpetual development utopias, as I call them, and endless economic growth has come to a sudden end in the current global financial situation. Uh, but if we continue our failure to human humanity, as some psychiatrists have called it, in continuing our current levels of engagement in funding allocations for global health, investing solely 
on the north-south transfer of medical technologies in what is called disease silos, like deposits where you know, invest all the resources uh, that we have in a single disease that narrowly contain vertical approaches to improve global health. If we do this, and we continue to do this, we're going to repeat failure after failure, loading money and more money into a bottomless pot to continue relying on the perpetual philanthropy of a few, as we've seen in the growth investment pattern of funds for research and action in terms of health, this is now in hands of the philanthropist, the great fortunes. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is one example. Uh, there are many like that, that who are done shaping the global health agenda to a large extent. It's not only the WHO business, it's now a business that is shared because the weight of the funding that comes from private sources into global health is, as, is not equal. Now, it's more than the whole budget of the WHO combined. Though we may disagree on what should be the future global health research agenda, and that it means we have to move now to uh, a new architecture of global mental health. Although we may disagree what is the future global health agenda com composition, what seems to have gained consensus over the few years is the uh, need to move beyond understanding global health as a simple listing of problems or disease categories and its worldwide distribution. Many of our most serious contemporary problems are an intricate part of the global crisis, global warming, ecosystem degradation, poverty and social inequalities, conflict and war, and finally the resource depletion are some of the fundamental drivers of uh, uh, powerly shaping the global health research agenda for today and the years to come. A balanced global mental health agenda for the failure, uh, for the, excuse me, for the future should focus not only on the global burden of illness, but also on the social, political, and economic determinants of health within which these diseases occur. Achieving social justice and health equity at the level of a nation implies a concerted effort to move towards a framework of global justice, global social justice, searching for a more equitable distribution of global power and resources. Moreover, we need to mobilize resources among donors and create innovative massive funding mechanisms for global health research and action programs in low and middle income countries. The recently created, for example, Global Financing Facility, GFF, so far has collected about $1 billion, out of which $240 million comes from Canadian sources. And this fund aims to be raised at $2.6 billion as a first step to close the $33 million funding gap in maternal, neonatal, child and adolescent health for 62 of the world's poorest countries. I must annotate for you uh, who are not following these uh, events in terms of funding that most of the funding that comes to global health comes for three diseases, communicable diseases. First and foremost, malaria, second, HIV AIDS, third, tuberculosis. And a fraction of the funding that's become available comes from for non-communicable diseases. Among others, even a fraction of that fraction comes to mental health. So there's a major inequality in the funding of these conditions. To maximize the research capacity then, and I am about to finish, uh, for innovation in low middle income countries and knowledge transfer for global health, we need to travel on at least two distinct directions in the innovation process. One, the downstream, searching for technological and psychosocial solutions, exemplified by global, public, and private product developments partnerships, uh, that is 
new drugs, new diagnostic and, uh, and new uh, therapeutic procedures, to build more efficacious interventions in the secondary level and clinical domains aimed at recovery from mental illness and mortality reduction. And meet an upstream in exploring more actively not only the proximal, but also the more distant causes of mental illness, the social and environmental origins of health and disease, and above all, the causes of the causes in search of systemic solutions and collective interventions exemplified by global mental health policy and global mental health systems research from a multi-sectoral, cross-cultural and transdisciplinary perspective. It seems clear from this discussion above that, that I have just mentioned that in the future a unifying new paradigm for global mental health needs to be driven both by biosocial and medical solutions and innovations. Substantive progress in the field of psychiatry, and I'm quoting here Bracken, Pat Bracken, a UK critical psychiatrist. He says that substantive progress in the field of psychiatry will not come from neuroscience and ne new neuropsychopharmaceuticals, important as this might be, but a fundamental critical re-examination of what mental health care is all about and rethinking of how genuine knowledge and expertise can be applied to the field of global mental health. With that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you.